Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And I'm Lauren Gorn. And today we're talking about the two biggest and most dominant varieties of English in the global language landscape. I'm talking about Canadian and Australian English. Obviously. <laughs> but first, we are in the latest issue of Babel Zine, which is really exciting. So Babel is a magazine about linguistics, which you should totally check out if you haven't heard of it already. They do lots of fun linguistics content that's accessible for general audience. We're big fans and we're in their Meet the Professionals series. So they did an interview with us about this very podcast. If you're listening to the show, you've already met us, but you can hear a little bit about how we got the show started and why we love doing it so much. And you can see our faces. <laughs> Something you can't do on this podcast, that is true. Which is very exciting. We also announced our artist for the art goal that we hit on Patreon. So Lucy is going to be doing art for us, and we linked to her art portfolio from our website and from Twitter, and it'll be in the show notes as well. Uh, you can see what that'll look like. We are really excited. As we mentioned in the Patreon episode, we'll be sharing um, kind of progressive art updates and images of like early sketches with our patrons. They'll also be getting a high res digital copy of the art when it's finished, and we'll be sharing it with everyone else as well in low res. Yeah, and we're making it available on various objects. I should say the art itself is not available. You can just see other stuff that she's done for other people. Which is super cute, and we're super excited. We also have our most recent Patreon bonus episodes. We have one on the Roses Are Red and other poetry memes. Um, I love a good poetry meme, and we discuss some of our favourite ones in that episode. Roses are red, violets are blue. I started this poem before I knew what I was going to do. <laughs> good, good save. Uh, <laughs> we like this bonus and we hope you will too. Okay. No, we have the power of editing, but no. <laughs> no, I don't think we're going to edit that part. Um, we also have our most, most recent bonus episode, which is advice about grad school. If you're thinking of doing linguistics, graduate research through a master's or a PhD, um, or any other really, because we talk about the kind of differences between the Australian and North American models for that. So it was a good grad school reminisce chat. Yeah. So picking a school, whether you actually want to go, what kinds of things to take into consideration when you're trying to go, getting funding, and all sorts of things about the different systems. We were both very excited to get to sit down with Lynn Murphy's book, The Prodigal Tongue, and we both enjoyed reading it so much, and we realised we were messaging each other about the book and its content and that we should just chat instead. It's much nicer. So The Prodigal Tongue is about US versus UK Englishes or UK versus US Englishes, depending on which country you bought the edition in. Very clever, sneaky marketing tactic. What version did you read, out of curiosity? I read uh, what's probably best described as the Canadian version, because it had the UK interior and the US cover. Wow, what a combo. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because it was an advanced version that Lynn's publisher very kindly sent along to me a couple months in advance. I only read it a couple days before the book came out um, because I've had other things You've to had do. other book related but things. But I appreciated having it sit there reminding me for those few months. Yeah, so I had this kind of combo hybrid version, which is the only one of its kind. And I feel is a very poetic metaphor to kind of the relationship that one has to a book like that when one is neither British nor American. I read the British version because my Kindle is linked to British Amazon. That's the unexciting reason. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's fair. We spent our lives in Australia getting UK and US editions of fittings depending on what whim people were on when they set up the market. So it doesn't really bother me. Oh yeah, same thing. We got the UK versions of the first couple of Harry Potter books and then we got like the American versions of the later oh, ones. Oh, poor you. <laughs> I don't know what happened there. So confusing. Um, so Lynn's book is focusing on what she calls the nation lects of the US and Britain, which means that like she focuses on what's considered standard and normal for those two varieties. And I don't think it's surprising that they're the focus of a lot of people's attention. Yeah, and especially when you think about what people have as their perception of a country from the outside, often what we have is that kind of export media. 
you know, like I see shows from the BBC or I see stuff from like NPR or big, you know, big media conglomerates which tend to overrepresent this standardized accent and underrepresent like regional dialects and class based dialects and all sorts of other varieties within each country. There's also a lot of angst in the UK about American English and aspirations in the US about British English that are kind of different to the internal debates about specific varieties. Yeah, so there's a lot of kind of tension there, and you definitely see that coming out in Lynn's book, where she spends a lot of time very carefully and meticulously debunking a lot of these misconceptions people have about these different varieties. So many amazingly bad and ill-researched conceptions. Remember, people, if you're wondering about whether a word is an Americanism, Edom Online is there and free, and it will tell you. You can you can look stuff up. Language is, is knowable. It is look upable. You don't have to just make a random snap judgment. <laughs> Other people have done this research for you and you can look it up. Or just call in. At the end of this book, I just wanted to call in and say, okay, anytime I need to know this. <laughs> uh, I think Lynn would be a bit overworked if everyone had a direct line to her to ask advice. And tweet at her. She's pretty, she's pretty responsive on Twitter. And she's had this blog called Separated by Common Language for many, many years, where she talks about a lot of stuff with US versus UK English, uh, especially because she's an American living in Britain. So she has this experience a lot. I think the thing that I kind of was reminded of and quite like about Lynn's book and the discussion of the different varieties is that it's not the case that British English is the parent language and American English is this like offshoot teenage delinquent that's off doing its own thing. Like, they're actually sister languages that have split from something that was, like, older and around Shakespeare's time and has diverged into two different but equally kind of placed varieties. And I think we kind of forget that that happens with dialects. We, we assume that British is older because it's in Britain, and that's not true. Yeah, but it kept changing after the Americans left, you know, after all the various waves of colonizers left the UK, the home dialect kept changing. And in some places kept changing faster. I mean, I know this is true for French in France versus French in Canada. French in France has actually changed faster than French in Canada has. And I think this is often true for kind of colonial languages, that they change faster in the cities of origin. So yeah, so there's, there's stuff that have changed kind of in both areas, and they've been evolving in parallel. But of course, Neither of us are American or British English speakers. And what happens whenever I read a book like this is that I just get really excited whenever Australia gets mentioned. I'm like, yes, there I am. Woo! Represented. I got very excited both and every time Australia was mentioned on your behalf, Lauren. Oh, thank you. Uh, and, uh, yeah. and also every time Canada was mentioned, which was not very many times. <laughs> every time Canada got mentioned, I was like, yes, Gretchen. <laughs> Shout out to our other world Englishes. Uh, some of whom we have very close affinity and affection for. Of course, we talked about New Zealand and their, like, super cool in-progress vowel shift that's happening during our vowel episode. So, hello, New Zealand, our next-door neighbours. Your next-door neighbours. My next-door neighbours, yeah. Uh, Yeah, and all other world Englishes, Indian English, South African English, Singaporean English, there are all sorts of varieties of English from other parts of the British Empire that were also influenced by colonialization and also developed separate and very interesting trajectories that we will definitely not be able to do justice to in this episode. And I think very important to say, like, they are all people's first language. It's not that Singaporean English is some kind of, like, language of convenience. It's the language that people grow up with. It's the variety that they speak every day. It has, like, so many great um, imports from the local Chinese varieties and Malay and these things, including my favourite word, chop, which I'll link you to in the show notes. A very important piece of vocabulary missing from other English varieties. Um, there are also kind of international Englishes that are used in kind of political and business contexts. EU English is known for being particularly quirky, I think. Yeah, so English as a lingua franca, where it's everybody's second language, like in Europe or with the UN, um, and you have a whole room full of English speakers who have a way of communicating with each other that has you know fewer idioms and fewer of the things that are difficult for uh, non-native speakers. And then when the native speaker walks into the room, suddenly it's like they're the one that's having a hard time being understood because they've got this different different access there. So there's a bunch of different ways that English can be used. And I think we thought that one of the things that would be very interesting to do with this episode is talk about how we personally fit into this this kind of gap or this kind of tension between US and UK English when 
you're not in either of these and you see yourself in both. Yeah, yeah, definitely. A lot of the debates around British and American English, it's never that one of us are like always on one side of that discussion or the other. Here's a question for you, Lauren. When you have to pick a drop down、uh, menu language on a website, yeah, and you're given the choice between US or UK, which happens to me a lot, which one do you pick? I pick UK because I also have a preference for ISE endings and spelling color with a U. And we talked about this with the vocal fries a lot about the kind of international spelling of English. So we'll link to that in the show notes because I go on about it quite a bit. So, like, UK English is close. Enough for me, but that doesn't mean that like all the lexical items and features of British English are also in my English. Yeah, I know. Sometimes I pick one and sometimes I pick the other because I tend to have color with a U, but also I Z E slightly more often, but I'm not sure if I actually do that more often or if I just started doing that because Spellcheck kept trying to insist that I do. Yeah, and Lynn said in the book it was quite interesting how those kind of technological decisions where you have to put yourself in one of those baskets seems to actually be driving British English speakers heavily towards saying we always use I S E, where it was in flux for like. Centuries before that, yeah. So spellcheck kind of promotes this idea that there's this one way to to do things, or like this word is or isn't in your spellcheck. So, do you want to tell us, Lauren, about what's your potted history of Australian English for those of us who don't know? What do people know when they're thinking about the history of Australian English? So, Australia was and still is home to anywhere between 250 and 400 languages before British settlers arrived, and I think that's an important thing that we. Often forget. So let's start the history with the first forty thousand years of settlement on country, and then in well before seventeen seventy eight, Cook came, figured out there was a bunch of habitable world. The UK needed a new colony because America was obviously no good to them anymore. And in seventeen seventy eight, the first settlers arrived, and then many many more arrived, and this was the beginning of kind of the Australian. National identity that we know now.、Um, the thing about Australian English is that people often use the melting pot analogy, where you had a lot of kind of convicts, but also some free settlers who came from various parts of the UK. So a lot of Northern Britain, some Scottish, some Irish people. So you have this real like mixture of people and backgrounds. And there's this thing called dialect leveling, where you know it doesn't take very long for the children to kind of even all of that out and establish some kind of general accent. What's quite interesting is that there's quite a lack of accent diversity compared to places like the UK and the US, and that's largely because it wasn't long after those early colonies were started that you get things like radio and the telephone and media that means you get less of that accent drift. That you get in places that were really, really isolated for sometimes centuries, and so we have accents that are mostly, really broadly, to grossly oversimplify accents based on class. So you have like a broad accent that normally correlates with people in the country. You have a middle accent, and we used to have this really fancy accent that sounded like a British BBC presenter, but we don't really have that anymore. So I speak a fairly kind of Urban, well-educated variety of English, and that's how we got to here. Okay, so I think I knew some of that, but I definitely didn't know so much how all the pieces fit together. So I feel like Canada has—I always think of Canada as having a relatively similar story to Australia, just with a little bit more time, depth, and another giant nation just off the southern border. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely a certain amount of similarity. There were a pretty similar number of Aboriginal languages、uh, first spoken in Canada before European settlers started arriving. The number that I'm able to find is 296 Indigenous languages spoken or formally spoken in the U.S. and Canada combined, and the number for Canada that I'm able to find is over 70 currently spoken. So there's some sort of gap between how many were formally spoken in Canada, but those statistics don't seem to be readily available. I guess also the like national boundary between the U.S. and Canada is an arbitrary. Post colonization exercise, rather than anything that reflected the reality that was there before. Right, exactly. So there's a bunch of languages that are spoken across the border. So maybe 
more accurate to talk about them as a whole in terms of, of Aboriginal languages. So the main thing that's responsible for kind of the mainstream Canadian accent as we think of it, and the reason that Canadian English sounds to a lot of people very similar to American English, is that a lot of uh, European settlers in Ontario were originally United Empire loyalists who were people who, when the American Revolution happened, they were like, no, we don't want no revolution. <laughs> uh, and so they went across the border to what was then the British territories in what's now Canada, and especially in what's now kind of southern Ontario. And so a lot of them settled there, and they spoke very similarly to how their neighbours had in the US. Right. But they had a different ideological alignment to their neighbours in the South. And uh -huh. so when they were looking to linguistic models, they weren't looking to this kind of like Noah Webster spelling reform stuff. They were looking to, well, you know, let's import some more British subjects from the UK and keep going with this British thing to maintain this British ideology on, on Canada. But very similar to what happened in Australia, there was a kind of dialect leveling where kids tend to talk like the other kids on the playground. And so if you can get a founding population of those kids that talk a particular way, they'll still talk like each other. So at an oral level, the language still sounds very similar to what it is in the US, but at a spelling level, and in some cases at a word level, things get borrowed in from the UK as well. Oh, kids doing good for the language once again. Yeah. So, and a lot of the settlers that headed west of Canada, Canada, you know, into the prairies and into British Columbia, they were often coming from Ontario. And so they brought that Ontario accent for the West. Right. It's not like Americans went north to Canada. No. Well, so Americans went north first. Well, proto-Americans, uh, non-Americans non, non uh, went north to to Ontario. And then from there, people spread west. So there's this right. a very similar accent from Ontario uh, which is kind of in the middle of Canada, all the way towards the west. Although there are differences that are arising now, and people are very keen on some of those more local differences. But east of that, you have Quebec, uh, which is where I live now, which had been settled by the French much earlier, and was, you know, taken over by the British, but there were still many French speakers there who are very uh, keen to maintain their French. And you have eastern Canadian provinces that were settled by the British earlier, before the Loyalists happened as part of this whole, you know, they could have become part of New England almost. Yeah. Um, and it's important to me to not leave them out because I grew up in Nova Scotia and there's a very different accent there. Right. And it doesn't sound so much like the rest of Canada. Hmm. The Nova Scotia, New Brunswick and PEI kind of all sound pretty similar to each other. What's PEI? PEI is uh, Prince Edward Island, sorry. That's okay. Um, and then you have Newfoundland, which only joined Canada after World War II. Really? Yeah, uh, like really recently. And so it has a very different cultural history and it has the most distinct of the Canadian English accents hmm. because it has a very, very different colonial history and a very different settlement pattern and was settled from different areas of the UK. What? Lots of Irish Gaelic speakers, right? Yeah, uh, Scottish Gaelic. Scottish Gaelic, sorry, wrong Gaelic. <laughs> it's okay. So there's Scottish Gaelic in Nova Scotia, especially in Cape Breton. Not so much in Newfoundland, I think there might be some in Newfoundland, but in Nova Scotia, okay. it's like the second most Scottish Gaelic outside of actual Scotland, hmm. uh, which is pretty cool. I learned yeah. a very little bit of Scottish Gaelic when I was a kid. <laughs> Not because Actually, it's... no, that's a lie. It is Irish Gaelic in Newfoundland, because that's what my friend Jill did her PhD thesis Oh, okay. On. So it's Irish Gaelic in Newfoundland, it's Scottish Gaelic in Nova Scotia. There we go. Um, but yeah, so you have this very different like the eastern part of Canada has more dialect diversity because it's been settled for longer and has a different different kind of settlement pattern than what's happening in the center and west portions. And then in the north, several of the territories have Inuit languages in Nuktitut and it's kind of a what's called a, sh a Sprachbund. It's a dialect continuum right. of a bunch of languages that are all understandable by the villages nearby, but not so understandable if you go too far away. Um, hmm, so they're cool. referred to as kind of a, a group of languages in the north. Those are official languages in, in Nunavut and the Northwest Territories. So there's lots of stuff kind of going on. You know, Canada has a national policy officially of English-French yeah. bilingualism, but then cool. certain territories have native languages as official languages up there as well. So I think there's slightly less dialect homogeneity than Australia has, but there's still kind of a, a Canadian accent. Yeah, there's sufficient time depth. There's like an extra century or two yeah. than what's happening in Australia. I think, you know, just thinking about those histories, those very similar histories, I think the thing that like as an outsider to the American, British, English stone throwing debates 
is that like people in Britain and people in Australia do this too, get angry about American English taking over. It's like, well, British English took over a lot. It's essentially a giant colonial steamroller across large patches of the globe. And (laughs) I just feel like you can't get angry about someone else flaunting their cultural and imperial dominance when that was your mode of operation for centuries. But I think in terms of, you know, a a modern citizen's life on the ground, that aligning yourself with a former colonial power can be a way of trying to resist a current one. Yeah. Of saying, okay, I've got, I've got a certain amount of identity. I've got a certain amount of distance from this or distinction from this, because at least I can, you know, choose my, my colonizer. (laughs) There's this interesting thing that happens with the last letter of the alphabet in Canadian English. So how would you say the last letter of the alphabet, Lauren? It is Z in my variety of English. So it's Z for me as well, but for most young Canadian children, it's Z because it rhymes in the alphabet song and it, you know, they get a lot of American children's TV programming. So young kids will generally sing the alphabet song ending with Z. And then at some point around teenagerhood... Yeah. They'll switch to Z. So you used to say Z when you were a kid and you didn't think about it. Yeah. And I didn't think about it. And now I'm like, oh, I would never say Z. Like, that sounds so weird. But it's because I switched just at the age when I was beginning to become conscious of, like, nation lex and nation states and countries having different identities like that. I mean, I was definitely overtly educated to make sure I said Z because Z was wrong and American. And those two things were directly correlated Yeah, I don't know if I was... I know I was just exposed to it. And at some point I was like, okay, like, which one's the Canadian one again? I'm going to need to pick that one. And so I was told that that Z was Canadian, especially. Uh, Mm. And, like, this this was the one I needed to pick. Right. And what's interesting is this has been happening for decades. So people who were kids in, like, the 60s and 70s... Yeah. ...said Z at the time and switched to Z when they grew up. So if you were looking at Canadian English in the 60s, you'd be like, oh... The language is changing. The young people are saying Z. One generation, Z will be dead. We can all move on. And then they came back. (laughs) So it's been going on for a number of decades, and it shows no signs of stopping because all the adults that I know in Canada (laughs) still say Z. Okay, and it's not like a... I feel like in Australia, it's a very overt, top-down, like, don't say Z, but it seems to be more people cluing into the Canadian-American distinction themselves. You know, there's a lot of a lot of Canadian identity because the U.S. is right there and it's so big and it's like it's it's always present. You don't get to be like hide from it halfway around the world. No offense. <laughs> the, yeah. A lot of Canadian identity is bound up in like not being the Americans. And so, right. You know, picking that as an explicitly Canadian option. But because Canadians often identify themselves with stuff that's very actually international, like, oh, we use the metric system. Like, so does the rest of the world. It's only the U.S. that doesn't use the metric system. Right. Yeah, true. And so, like, when, if Americans move to Canada, apparently this is one of the things that they'll change about their speech. They'll start saying Z because if they say Z, Canadians will really remark on it. One thing that Lynn's book reminded me of is that it was always the smallest things that draw the most attention and become kind of symbols of identity and being part of a particular dialect group you know she points out lots of really subtle things about grammar and things about the lexicon that people are actually kind of happy to have different and don't think that much about it unless they're kind of specifically editors or something um but it is these few things like z versus z that like people those are the hills that people choose to make their stand on and you can tell that people are really into like these particular discussions because they're often the things that appear on accent maps or lexical maps especially those ones where you do a quiz and it tries to tell you where you're from and they're almost always for the uk and the us i'm so jealous of those quiz because it's because like (laughs) i take them anyway because like it's a language quiz of course i'm going to do it but like then they just put me some random weird spot in the us that of course doesn't mean anything to me uh because i'm definitely not from there and (laughs) I just want someone to make one for Canada sometime. We made those small maps for the Linguistics Roadshow quite a few years ago, and I mentioned the potato cake, potato scallop, uh, lexical variation one in our episode on speaking a single language. 
um, because Australians really, really got into these maps that we made. There were 10. A bunch of them are about lexical differences. One of them is an accent difference, where Adelaide is the only place that says dance instead of dance. Oh. And this is kind of a famous Adelaide variation. And people really, really got into it because we always get stuck, you know, kind of being on the outside of these maps for other people. I said this to Bert Vox, who he's the, the linguist who made the initial data set that was at the base of the New York Times dialect quiz that was very, very popular in the US. And he's also done some stuff with British English dialects. And he has this new American English dialects survey that people can do that gives you updated set of heat maps with new questions. Uh, we'll link to that because it's very cool. Yeah. But I have him on Facebook now. <laughs> and so I said, Bert, your survey is great. But like, are you ever going to make a Canadian one of these? Because I'd really like to <laughs> what know. Did he and say? He was, well, he was like, maybe. So one of these days, I figured maybe if I put some pressure on him in the podcast, maybe he'll he'll do it. I would be very excited if I can do a survey and figure out get get a, get a customized heat map of uh, of my dialect. One of the other things I really enjoyed about Lynn's book, The Prodigal Tongue, is the chapter on things that are untranslatable between British and American English. So these are words that we all use and we don't think that much about, and they're pretty common words, but it turns out they have really different meanings in both Britain and America. And I thought instead of kind of... I feel like we should put a caveat before saying untranslatable, oh, yeah. because we did do a whole episode about how untranslatability is like not this a real true. thing. She talks about this a bit too. It's not that they're not untranslatable, but yeah. it's the fact that they are untranslated and we all go about our lives not thinking about the fact that we're talking about the same-ish but slightly different things. And I think the thing is, is that we you can think you're translating something between it. Like, you can think, oh, well, soup. Everyone knows what soup is. You know, it's this hot, liquidy food thing that you eat out of a bowl that's savoury. That's a great definition of soup. Um... <laughs> But there's actually differences between what people mean by a prototypical soup when they say soup in the UK versus the US. Yeah. So instead of kind of telling you what these things are, Gretchen, I thought we could quiz each other about what our prototypical idea of each of these things is. How's that sound? Okay. So shall we start with soup? Let's start with soup. I'm hungry. Uh, what is your prototypical <laughs> soup? I think, you know, it's like a chicken noodle soup. You know, it's it's got little bits of chicken in it and, and noodles or maybe like a like a vegetable soup with little you know chopped up bits of vegetables in it what's your prototypical soup yeah a vegetable soup like a minestrone with maybe a bit of pasta but lots of vegetables and also lots of liquid um but also things like tomato soup i'm totally fine with those being kind of standard soup for me yeah, so I think the thing that we're getting at is that the prototypical american soup is a brothy soup so it has like a clear liquid um, and then it has stuff floating in it yep. that's vegetables or meats or pasta or whatever. And a prototypical British soup is a pureed soup. So it's like a cream of mushroom, a cream of chicken, a cream, cream of, of mushroom is a soup, cream of corn is a soup, I think. Or it's a like a leek and potato soup that's pureed and it, or it's a tomato soup or it's these kinds of yeah, pureed soups. I guess that's true. While we're on the topic of food, again, this is one... I'm probably just showing my vegetarianness rather than any Australianness. Um, but bacon, <laughs> what 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 is bacon? Well, to you, <laughs> uh, let, let me let me meat explain bacon to you. Um, so <laughs> okay, so for me, a prototypical bacon is the kind that's like long and slender and has like streaks of meat and and fat in yeah, it. Yeah, that's bacon, right? And then. <laughs> You can get back bacon. What's that? Which is like pretty obscure and I don't do it very much. Back bacon is like a like a small pork chop. It's like it's more oblong and doesn't have the streaks of fat right. in it. But I don't really have it that often. Like bacon is generally just the streaky kind. Okay. That is all I think of as bacon. I didn't know there was any other. Well, so the ironic thing is, is what Canadians call back bacon is apparently what Americans call Canadian bacon. Oh. And I'm like, excuse me, because like we don't actually eat that <laughs> as a prototypical bacon in Canada. So like, I don't know where you got this idea. You're, you're spreading false prototype rumors. And apparently Brits call their prototypical bacon is what I would call back bacon. And then they have this other thing called streaky bacon, which is my prototypical bacon. Yeah. And I think streaky bacon is a totally clear and transparent name yes. for it. 
because it does have little streaks. But not necessary in Australian English, I think. If you said you were making yeah. bacon and it wasn't that, a very tired Saturday morning person would be very upset with you. <laughs> yeah, I think. As it is, I never cook anyone bacon, so I've never had to have this problem in the UK. One that Lynn talks about and that I've also blogged about, so I'm like personally invested and was like horrified to discover that people have another meaning for is the word frown. And specifically, Gretchen, where on your face would you point to if you were defining a frown for someone? The mouth? Okay, good. You are a correct and normal person. <laughs> um, because obviously I'm not prescriptive, but like this is one of those times where I just literally can't. I do not have the other semantic version in my head. The other version being... I was really worried about the future of this podcast, Lauren. <laughs> if we were going to disagree about frown, like, we may have irreconcilable No, it would be fine as long as we're not ever unhappy with each other. Um, in the UK, a frown is like when you furrow your eyebrows... What? ...and look super serious. But that's what like, furrowing your eyebrows is the word for. <laughs> And also, like, if you don't have frown for, like, the opposite of a smile in your mouth, then, like, what is it called when you do a sad feeling face? I mean, I like, guess... Like, for me, that's such a necessary, basic... There's a pout, semantic, maybe? But pout is, like, sad and annoying. Because, like, when I do a sad feeling face, I mean, like, there's the exaggerated, like, clown frown that's, like, really, really frowny... When I'm actually sad, I don't actually make that face. Whereas I can see actually furrowing your brow. Oh, no, I've become a frown defender. <laughs> no, Gretchen. <laughs> so <laughs> this, I encountered this too when it was like raging its way around the linguistics blogosphere because, you know, I couldn't avoid it. And it explained for me something that had always confused me, which was there's some, some of these stats, you know, those like motivational yeah. quotes that go around that are like, it takes, you know, 57 muscles to frown, but only 16 muscles to smile. I've probably got the numbers wrong, but they're yeah. probably fake numbers anyway. And I would look at those numbers and be like, but how can it take more muscles to frown? Because when I frown, my face is just relaxed. Like, And I'm using exactly the same mouth muscles anyway. Like, where are these other extra 40 muscles coming from? But if you have the frown that means the furrowing of your brow, then it's a whole face activity, and it does take more muscles. I love that there were people on the flip side who were like, oh my gosh, I now understand the turn that frown upside down saying, because I didn't understand, uh. like, like unfurrowing your eyebrows just looks really weird. Um <laughs> Is that just, like, raising your eyebrows, yeah. like, really high? Like, you're surprised? So, like, everyone clearly lives happily and life goes on and no one thinks that much about... And we can, like, cope with these variations in the language. When it was going around initially, you know, people were posting about it on, on social media, on their blogs, and you could people, you know, raging in the comment sections being like, how have we been using this word for so long with these two different definitions and nobody's ever realised? Yeah that they were actually two different things. And it, you know, it wasn't in some major dictionaries and like people were, people were surprised. Very confused. Very confused. Yeah. I think it's also interesting. I think there's a little bit of a generational difference as well happening in Australia. I think older Australians may lean towards the UK mm. eyebrow definition. Interesting. So there's some additional complexity happening beyond just the national level. One of the things that I found very interesting about Lane Murphy's book was talking about politeness and the use of the word please in the British versus American context. So, Oh my gosh, if, yes. <laughs> if you wanted to politely request that someone do something, like if you're in a shop and you're asking for a cup of coffee or something, yeah. how, do you, how do you ask that? I order coffee every single day and now I can't remember. <laughs> um... Can I please get a flat white? Is I think what I say. <laughs> so you don't say, can I get a flat white? No, um, I could say, can I get a flat white? Thanks. Maybe that's what I say. Maybe I say thanks instead of please. Mm. Uh oh, we've, we've broken the please isogloss. Mine is kind of confounded because these days when I order coffee, I pretty much always order it in French because I'm doing it <laughs> in Montreal. Um, well, in French, actually, I don't use s'il vous plaît because it requires me to commit to whether I want to say s'il vous plaît or s'il te plaît. Yeah. And I don't know whether or not I want to 
address someone formally or not, so I just avoid saying please entirely. And we've talked about your anxiety about formal and informal French around Quebec, oh my gosh, haven't we? It's so difficult. Um, so instead, I just put like extra conditional on the verb. So instead of saying like, you know, can I get a coffee? I'll say like, could I get a coffee? Or like, would, would I be able yeah. to get a coffee? And I just like put more stuff on the verb because like the longer it is, the more polite it is, basically. Yeah, definitely. So Lynn did this really interesting interview on The Illusionist, which is another linguistics podcast, uh, about whether or not people use the word please. And I think the British story is that you need to say please because it sounds polite, and if you don't do it, you're not being polite, no matter how many things you add onto the verb or how many woulds and coulds yeah. and may I get you put on the verb. You've got to say please or else it's rude. Yeah. The American story is it's better to do stuff with the verb because if you say please, it sounds like you're giving an explicit order. And it's better to try to minimize the imposition by trying to make the order less explicit. And so saying please actually makes yeah. it seem like there's a bigger power differential. Like please is the thing that parents tell their kids to say to adults. It's not like a thing that polite strangers who are adults with each other say to each other because you're trying to minimize the imposition there. Yeah, I think I definitely do a lot of like, would it be possible to get some water? But it's something about that that particular word gets perceived as as rude on the on the British side. Uh, like literally gets perceived as the opposite. Yeah. Like Americans aren't using it to be polite, and Brits are using it to be polite, and then they wonder why they find going to each other's countries weird. It's like seventy five percent because please, <laughs> because please. Any last thoughts about Australian and Canadian English or Lynn's book? So. One of the weirdest things that I noticed when I was, so I live tweeted the book, I tweeted, you know, various photos of interesting sections that. that I found from the prodigal tongue. So we'll link to that. And one of the things that I noticed that was a very Canadian moment to me was, uh, so she has this passage about the metal. The stuff that we call tinfoil, but also call aluminium Yeah, in Australian English. So you, so you call it al aluminium? Yeah. And how do you spell it? It's got lots of M's and U's and it's got two, it's got like, yeah, L A L U M I N U M. So the relevant thing is that in Canadian English, we say aluminum, but most Canadian spelling guides recommend to spell it as if it's aluminium. Ah. Because we inherited the British spelling with the American pronunciation. Oh, you're just like keeping everyone happy. <laughs> Just, just like a parable for Canada. In the meantime, we have this massive spelling pronunciation mismatch. Yeah. It's almost like the cover of your lexicon is different to the content. <laughs> Don't judge a lexicon by its cover. For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on iTunes, Google Play Music, SoundCloud, or wherever else you get your podcasts. And you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. You can get IPA scarves and other Lingthusiasm merch at lingthusiasm.com slash merch. I tweet and blog as Superlinguo. I can be found as at Gretchen A. McSee on Twitter. My blog is allthingslinguistic.com. To listen to bonus episodes, ask us your linguistic questions, and help keep the show ad-free, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm, or follow the links from our website. Current bonus topics include Roses Are Red and Other Poetry Memes, Advice About Linguistics Grad School, and The Semantics of Sandwiches. And you can help us pick the next topic by becoming a patron. Can't afford to pledge? That's okay, too. We also really appreciate if you can rate us on iTunes or recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone who needs a little more linguistics in their life. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gorn. Our audio producer is Claire, our editorial producer is Emily, and our production assistant is Celine. Our music is by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic! Lingthusiastic!